All right, the gun reviews in the bunker seem to be popular, right? But the tabletops are not dead. This is just another format. I will go back to tabletops. I have some others that I have not produced yet. So we'll go back and forth. We're gonna do a, a variety of production here in TMP. While I have TD, um, I'm gonna be using him. How hard have we been working over the last week? Pretty hard. Uh, we've been putting in about mm, probably 70 hours a week on TMP between managing the gear, range sessions in the desert, taking notes, studying, uh, making modifications to gear, not just not, uh, guns, but we're talking knives, Heck, watches too. It's just, it's a nonstop flow of gear stuff here. We enjoy it though, it's fun. Yeah, we're banking content for a while at least. Yeah, I, I need to do it. This uh, is a really busy time of year for me. So uh, I'm working as hard as I can for you guys. Thanks for joining TFP Patreon. If you don't want to, still love you anyhow. This video will will post first, of course, in Patreon. Like I always say, they're well ahead of the A channel. The B channel is actually alive and kicking. Yeah, I don't think anyone <clears throat> noticed that. They will. Uh, WRVs are going to be posting on the B channel for the time being. That's watch review videos. And thanks for asking. The watch for this gun review for the watch guys is, got to make sure I get the number right, the SSC 233 Seiko chronograph, orange and black. It's a solar powered chronograph. Pretty awesome. Along with my boring wrist computer. Yeah, also known as an Apple watch to some people. But see how I'm holding it up right there and it doesn't show the time? That's not a watch. Yeah, that's... A watch is at any angle it shows the time. It's a oh, yeah. Seiko 5 series, kind of like the Monster. Seiko 5 Sports Desk Diver. Well. Great, yeah. great watch. Go watch my review on that one. And I haven't officially done this, but it's recommended. Otherwise, I wouldn't have gotten it for the show. Check the links under the description if you really like it. That's correct. Because the Seikos are tough to find. They don't really have names, and they're all inscrutable series of numbers and letters. Most manufacturers are doing that. It's, yeah, it's insane. What insane. is that? An NH0515-1A. There may or may not be a Russian Su-100 in 172nd scale behind us, by the way. Tank destroyer of World War II. Quite effective, I understand, in the game World of Tanks, which I've never played. Nothing fancy, you should play World of Tanks. Roger that. I'll shut down TMP then. I don't we'll have do time. We'll do that when World of Tanks starts paying. <laughs> Haven't you noticed that? Everyone does No, those. I have no idea. So if we were doing a normal ad thing right now, we would go, and guys, I am really hooked on this new game called World of Good Tanks. Good point. And it because, would be organic. Right, because a lot of YouTube videos, they have third-party advertising where the guys paid off to say the thing, yep. promote it. Uh, the large video game YouTubers do that all the time, and so they're they're getting payoffs. And you can tell we don't do any of that because they go from normal human talk to weird corporate like. Yeah. I am really excited about this exciting, wonderful new opportunity to play World of yeah. Tanks. If you use the keyword "fart face," you're going to get 20 free tanks. And while shells we're talking about video games, this new Sylvania plasma screen TV is amazing. Beautiful. I think plasma's dead. It's probably all LED by now. Who knows? Yeah. Who has time to watch TV? Yes, we're getting into a gun review, I promise. So we talked about the watch and then the official knife. It's going to be a fixed blade for the Bunker M1 carbine review will be the beautiful, gorgeous SOG Agency. Beautiful. Feature length review posted, I think, around 2011 or 2012. Still an amazing, beautiful, collectible fixed blade knife with a pretty interesting history and background with a Max SOG. Uh, and I kind of went into that history, probably too in depth. Beautiful knife though, OS 8, black stacked leather washer handle. Long, long handle and a beautiful leather sheath. So good job, Sog. And as far as I know, they're still making the Aegis. Very good buy. Oh, I'm sorry, I said the Aegis, the agency. Because I carry an Aegis all the time. All the time. All right, yes, it is a gun review. We got some guns in the background. They may or may not come into play during this WR, uh, WRV, the GRV, but we're going to be talking about this gun right here, Tactical Doodle, please present <laughs> arms. <clears throat> the Auto Ordnance M1 Carbine. This is model number AOM130. It is a standard 15 round M1 Carbine. Okay, we do have a couple M1 Carbine reviews out in TMP. We've had them for a long time. One was a World War II era. Dude. And inland, right? Hot, hot yep. That's not it, though. Is that the quality? Yeah. Okay. So go look at that. There's a lot of philosophy contained in that original M1 carbine review. 
We'll touch on a little bit of it here, but I don't want to go heavy on philosophy because we've done it already. Okay, really briefly though, we, we will visit it again because there's a lot of people that will not watch that or that joined after 2012 or whenever. Um, and then going back after that, I Excellent. went out and bought an inland manufacturing, a new production M1 carbine, and we had a ton of problems with that gun. And I did a pretty much, I think, negative review on that. It was a non-recommend. We had to, I even went to the trouble of sending it back to the manufacturer at least once, maybe twice. I think we did twice. He was bending the lips on the magazines that to was... make them function and they were still, it was still non-functioning pretty much. That's what was most irritating is here we had problems with it. And when I opened the package, it had the little thing from the tech saying, this is what we did. And it said, customer complains, jams, period. Bent feed lips for magazine, period. End of list. That was it. Just bent well, feed lips on one uh, mag. I talked to the guy at Inland. I will say he was a very nice guy. I thought their customer service was fantastic. It really was. He's responsive. I've got no problems with that. My issue was it didn't work after all that. So we brought it to Tabletop at the time, reviewed it. So this will be the second modern production M1 carbine we're reviewing, and we have some good things to say about it. Now, I don't know if you're like us, and by like us, I mean uh, we like pizza. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, we love World War II guns a lot. We love two things, World War II guns and World of Tanks. On your iPhone or iPad, no. <laughs> is World of Tanks a real game? I hope not. Totally is. Oh, crap. We're getting the only way publicity. I know about World of Tanks is my friend Ray plays it all the time. And he tells me about it. Right? And I said it in some tabletop reviews. Guys who play World of Tanks know tanks. Because they have all the specifications, they really learn the tanks. So this SU-100, they know all about it. Yeah. They've done a lot more than I do. I like that part. Because That's they cool. are actually, it's yeah. kind of a training environment, a realistic training environment with realistic capabilities, and they're employing weapon systems of the era. Some of those video games are very instructive. Cool. And you and I were talking, this is kind of off subject, relax, we'll get to the gun. Uh, some of the uh, younger generation, actually, uh, some of the video games have done a real service, yeah. both both for weapon systems like tanks, but also for like this, the M1 carbine, that they know about the M1 carbine because of, what's that video game? Call of Duty. Call of Duty. They know about the M1 Garand, the M1903. That's something to be said. Yeah. And, it, I, and if these people end up getting guns, they join the NRA, they're politically active, it preserves our gun rights, so it's all good. All right. So we did the Inland. Uh, that didn't go so great. We ended up selling it at a great loss. We pitched that thing. And then we went out and bought this one. Not given to us, not a loaner. This is our gun. It's an auto ordnance M1 carbine. I really wanted to loan one, but I talked to Gunnies and they never had one. And I don't know. This one, uh, I don't know if I got a smoking deal on it, but it was okay. It was an okay deal. It was okay. They aren't super popular. They're kind of a niche rifle, so I wouldn't expect your local store to have like four or five on the rack of different types and description. I will say this though, and I told you this off camera, the M1 carbine, the way I see it, and I could be completely wrong, has a sustained sell rate through all the years. It's not a trendy gun, it's just always selling. If that were not the case, you would not have uh, auto ordnance or who owns them, like car arms. Car. Yeah. And they wouldn't have produced this because gun makers produce new guns like this because why? They want to make money. And if they don't sell, they'll go out for a while and the next thing you know, they're not around. I think this one is sticking around. Yeah. Okay, so it comes in this version, AOM 130, 15 round. For restricted states, AOM 140 is the 10 rounder. And then the super cool AOM 150 paratrooper. Paratrooper's cool. Uh, which is not super comfortable to shoot. I have shot them before. It smacks your cheek pretty good. But dang, is it cool. It's very cool. It's cool, man. And uh, who knows, maybe later on we'll hook into a paratrooper stock M1 carbine. And then we'll mention a couple competitive options and variability on the formula, formula because this is a 30 carbine cartridge, which ballistically is equivalent or actually bettering what? Just a little bit better. Then an, what? An equivalent, like, we're going into philosophy of use right now. Lever what? gun. 357 lever gun. Okay, cool. There. Assuming, like, same 110 grain bullet, same barrel length, they're pretty similar. Okay, so a little bit better by some measurements. A little uh, bit. And it depends on the 357 round you're shooting. Yeah. But for such a, such a soft shooting, controllable, short overall length carbine, 
That says something. And again, I'm repeating what I said POU-wise in the original M1 carbine review. It's pretty awesome that way. And so if we talk about POU briefly, it's for people that maybe don't want to shoot a 5.56 round. They don't, and I have a Tavor in the background right here. Uh, whatever reason, they don't like the, lo the loudness. They can't hit with it very well. And again, this is a bull pup, but you know, it represents something small, compact, overall length. Perfect gun for them. Mrs. Nothing Fancy loves the M1 carbine. And this dude right here says this, it should be her go-to tactical carbine choice, true or false? It's the, for some reason, whenever we've given her a carbine, because when we tried to break in the inland, we kept running hundreds of rounds through it. And one of the outings, we took her for the plate rack. God, we shot a lot of rounds through it. She was killing it with that. She was better than any other gun in inventory, really. I mean, we had a bunch of different, all the testers we had at the time, the ARs, the AKs, she didn't shoot any of them as well as she did the, the little carbine, and she knew how to operate it just picking it up. She was like, Very oh, okay. intuitive. Kink, kink. Whereas very, some, very low force retraction on the bolt, which is awesome. And, and she also shot our World War II era inland. Yeah. Couple so at years. the time we had that. So, philosophy of use, there you go. So for shooters who are intimidated, new shooters, small statue uh, shooters. The gun was intended for who when it came out in World War II? For rear line dudes. Rimps. That's correct. So, people uh, that whose primary job was not combat duties, if I remember right. Mortarmen. Mm -hmm. Mortarmen. Yeah. Radio. Well, they were, they were front line, but... Um, it and was you adopted by frontline troops, though. Once they found out how reliable and awesome the M1 carbine was, I think they were fighting over it. Yeah. Right? It was handy. Very handy. As cool as the Grand was, you don't always want to carry nine pounds of wood and steel on you. So, did we ask this question in our favorite World War II weapons? Which, by the way, is a separate bunker video. Watch out for that one. That one's super fun. Which one would you choose over the M1 Grand or the M1 carbine if you're storming the beaches of Iwo Jima? I think I know what I answered. It's a, it's a tough, tough, tough decision because you get a little more power with the Grand. But in the jungle, if you're running through brush, a little carbine might be a better friend to you. Yeah, and we had that jungle discussion, as I yeah. remember. I would still choose an M1 Grand for its hitting power, especially if I had some longer shots. But if you go in close quarters combat, house to house, dense jungle canopy, charges, <laughs> like you're, uh, yeah. you know, you're facing a charge of Japanese soldiers, then... M1 carbine is probably my choice with a whole bag of 15 round magazines. Well, that's the thing with these for the 15 rounders at least. This is a could, 30 in here. By you the could way. fit about four 15 rounders for the carbine in the space of three clips. Ammo, for that M1 grand. ammo was a lot lighter. You could carry a lot more. We're still talking POU, yeah. and those th same things apply today. So it's funny that we consider the M1 carbine an under the radar tactical carbine that it's often considered in some states, maybe not a modern production one, but an older one. Show them that one. Here comes a quality hardware made in 1944 M1 carbine. Show them close. Look at that old walnut stock. Awesome. This is this is not period. This is repro right here. The sling is repro, repro. But original stock, this is green park rise, quality hardware, 1944 production with a bayonet green park rosation M1 carbine. So it's considered in a lot of places as just a curio and a relic. So if we're talking about this, maintaining possession of your guns, this will be probably the last to be banned, I would think. It'll be a little more resilient. Yeah, it's still a semi-auto and all that stuff still plays and the protectionists are always scared of it, but it doesn't look intimidating. But notice it even had, this one at least has a bayonet lug, the fearsome bayonet lug. Right. No pistol grip, no flash hider. Yeah. Look how beautiful that gun is. So, and we're still, t I guess I have to go into a couple things on POU, uh, which I probably did with Inland. Sorry if I'm repeating, but again, our GRVs, they're not five minutes long. They're, it's mostly gun TV, it's entertainment, right? So we're gonna press ahead. Um, one thing about buying a World War II era M1 carbine that is both good and bad, the good is it's all kinds of second cool. You know, they're awesome, they're great. Uh, the bad is they're hard to find. When you do find them, they're usually going to be more expensive than this new production right here. Quite a bit more. Uh, the bad would be sometimes they're not reliable. You're going to have to do a spring swap out. Maybe there's some other issues going with it. When we got this quality hardware one, we had a bent front sight blade, which could easily be confused by the middle front sight blade. That is an issue. Had to be rectified. I did it very carefully. 
because we still want this to be shootable. And another bad thing is you don't want to put rounds on it. Do you want to go out with your World War II era carbine that's worth uh, a fair amount of money and gaining more every year as they become more rare and put thousands of rounds through it, TD? That's why I've been trying to get one of these. Yeah, and actually, uh, this is a nut and fancy family purchase. It, it, yeah, we're reviewing it, but this is something we want in our systems. This is a gun. You go out and buy the auto ordinance M1 carbine. Now you don't feel guilty going out and putting down 500 rounds in a day. You know, beat this thing. It's a user. It's a high quality produced M1 carbine. It doesn't as of yet have collectability, but it has all the form factor, all the functionality. Well, most of it. There's some differences in the safety we're going to cover over features. That is why you would consider getting this. So it is still a valid tactical carbine, a valid without rule of law option, a valid self-defense gun. It's so light and easy to carry. This is... This one, oh, here's a new production. Five pounds and six ounces is all this weighs. That is super, super light. Uh, you're going to have to work really hard to get your AR to that weight. Yeah. You're going to be I'm buying a lot of funky, super expensive little titanium there you go. bobbits and widgets. And Skeletonized stuff. bolt carriers or exotic metals. Uh, you can totally do it for sure. And it's always fun explaining to your wife why you paid $300 for... Why did you pay yes, finally. that much? If you have to explain to your wife. It's dwarven mithril and titanium. Perfect. Are Not you in favor of explaining to your wife all your gun purchases, Tactical Doodle? No. It's not married, by the way. No, but we get a lot of mail from people about hiding it from the wife and how do you buy stuff without destroying your marriage. And I did it for years. I mean, there's a lot of gun purchases I didn't tell her about. And then she'd see it five years later and go, where did that come from? I was like, I've had it forever. It Sometimes it was a week after I got it. That's Are you in favor of that process that I did, yeah. by the way? Yeah, she never really noticed. She didn't, she didn't care Oh, we had some people. fights. She was not happy. Philosophy of use, we're done with it for right now. Uh, features on the auto ordnance M1 carbine. I'm going to start with a stock because I think they did a fantastic job on it. This is a beautiful American walnut stock. Looks to be oil rubbed. Just a beautiful stock. I think it beats hands down. I'm talking uh, wood to metal fit, the, the finish of it. Uh, I think it beats that inland manufacturing, modern production one. Not that that stock was horrible. As I remember, it wasn't horrible, but this one's better. That one is better. Yeah. I, another thing I really love about the gun is that it is parkerized and not blued. Yep. The only thing that would make me happier would be... On the parkerization, my if favorite were, color. If it were green. There you go. Green parkerization. I love it. And this one actually is green parkerized. It's old, but you can still see it. This is a green parkerized 1944 M1 carbine. So it's all greased. It was packed in cosmoline. It's cosmoline stained. Yes, we have cleaned it. I did it laboriously. But at least it's parked. I love that. Standard uh, protective ears on the front sight. No big changes there. And TD, if anywhere along these features you want to jump in, because he kind of studies all the books and the differences in the features of the Garands, the 1903s, M1 carbines, jump in and say so. In that case, why on earth would you make a reproduction M1 carbine? Keep in mind, a lot of people buying this want like the perfect M1 carbine. It comes configured like the original first edition M1 so why would you not boot, put like little stamps on the stock like this? Yeah. This is the, whenever you see that, yeah, the agreed. crossed cannons, I totally agree with that. that shows that that's original, that it was accepted by the ordinance board. That is awesome because it's fairly rare that these haven't been completely destroyed or canned or tossed over mm -hmm. time. So it's not that expensive. It's maybe $50 for a stamp and it oh, takes you, well, eight not seconds. Even that. It's just Why? a heated, it's just a heated yeah. iron that burns it into the wood before they finish it. Yeah. What they should have done is come up with their own auto ordinance, yeah. something, just some type of logo, really cool. Uh, that's World War II ish that, and people would go, well, they don't want it to be, uh, you yeah. know, mistaken for a World War II. Dude, there's no way this gun would ever be mistaken for a no. World War II M1 carbine. To anyone who's mildly familiar with the type, says me. I, I think that's a great point. You can tell easily. All right, if you don't go here, put it on top of the handguard awesome. wood right here. In the cold, no less. Well, it's, yeah. it's the easiest thing, and they make other functional compromises, as you'll see, in the pursuit of originality. 
They say we want it to be original. We're going to give it this crappy thing because that's how the original was. Well, then, as I go, and let's press because there's other things I want to say down here. Jump in and say what you preferred they would have done. Yeah. So it's, it's funny that you're, you have a good point of why they chose the features they did. I think most people will be happy and they, they're not M1 carbine experts. I think there's, collector, there's collectors and expert collectors for every gun I ever review. And they may look at this and go, there's no way I'd buy it. You know, it has a, is this high, considered a high or low wood? I don't even know. This would be <laughs> low wood because you can see the entirety of the arm. There you go. And actually, I do like this stock. I remember. I love the stock. I think it's great. I remember reading later on in production, they started to do rougher wood, which this one kind of feels like. Show it to them Supposedly closely. because it doesn't <clears throat> reflect as much light. So this one, when you grab it, you're like, ooh, it's kind of rough. And earlier production was smooth and kind of nice. I but, did not know that, actually. That's, you just taught me something. If you read uh, the M1 Collector's Guide, I think Bruce Canfield wrote a pretty good one. Cool. He, by the way, stuff. again, studies that stuff all the time. Then it has a narrow band, uh, barrel band. There are narrow. all types of variations on this, but this is what they chose. I have no problem with it. It retains well. It didn't come loose. This is their stupid sling swivel they put on it. The first problem I have with it is that it is finished poorly. It's bright. It's not park rice. It's squared. Horrible. I mean, if you're going to do a sling swivel, do it right. I would have preferred, if you're going to go modern, go modern. Make it more rounded like a QD swivel. Awesome. Make it park rise. We would not have had a problem with this. It's so narrow, we actually had to take the metal band, uh, and I'm talking this way. It's very narrow this way. I had to take this metal protective uh, band or the cap off this sling to thread it. Which and is, then we had to glue it back on. It's absolutely Amazing. baffling to me because this is the M1 carbine sling. You can't tell me there are like 800 different types of slings. They're like, well, there's variable widths. Tactical doodle getting worked up in the bunker. Show them that other sling how to do it. So here's a quality hardware M1 carbine circa 1944. They got it. Why don't you just do that? Space. You can fit the tab through yeah. for the sling for the gun. Relax, TD. Moving on. Irritating. So this was a project to put the sling on. Okay, it's a miss. What I really want to do is pop this off, just totally pitch this goofy squared sling that Auto Ordnance put on and put on something better. Yeah. And maybe a, a, a one that I could find, a period one that would fit and I could attach it to the attachment better. A Type 3 with the bayonet lug that a lot of collectors absolutely hate. Speaking of which, uh, I think they're... I'm trying to think if their paratrooper has a bayonet lug on it, the auto ordnance. I don't, I don't remember. Think it does. I, we really like the bayonet on just for second cool. Not that we're running a bayonet, but look at how cool this is. It does is. look cool. It's just so cool. So this is a bayonet lugged M1 carbine again. Has a little bit close. of covering there. And a lot look of... Look at the coloration on that. How yeah. cool that is that. Green park. It's all oiled, stained. Probably served with a typist in, in the 1950s. We'd like to think it served in the war, but there's no way. This is in too good condition. Yeah. I think any war, M1 carbine, M1 car, uh, carbine, I'm sorry, M1 grand, M1 carbine would be thrashed. Moving along, here's more parkerization, standard bolts, simple operation of the M1 carbine as discussed previously. This is not the original rear sight on this. This is actually a replacement sight that I put on it. Not that the original flip peep sight shown right here, guys, is completely awful. It worked just fine. It gave a good sight picture, but this is a cost saving measure. Don't you think, TD? And an originality measure. Okay, tell them briefly about that. As the M1 carbine was designed, that is the sight it was running up until a couple years into World War II. Since it's like super non-adjustable, like not at all, they kind of didn't really like it so much, yeah. and they started designing the other types, which you see on these ones. Well, you can drift it left and right in a dovetail, but elevation-wise, you're screwed. That's the reason why I put on this one, and plus, we just like this one better. So, I forget the brand of this one, but it's very high quality, actually. It's parkerized, really nice. It went into the dovetail, not easily. I actually had to file it down to make it fit. It was about an... I don't know, half hour project. TD and I did it, and then we re -blued it, put it in the dovetail. But now it's fully adjustable, makes us happy, and uh, it's awesome. And it mimics this. Look, here's an original. Yep. So this M1 is M1 carbine. The, this is not a replacement. That's an original. You see that knurling on there that shows this is a stamped one. So this is at least mostly original to this thing. This is probably Arsenal rebuilt at some point. Right. 
It's original to the gun, probably are, not, but it's original so. from the eras of probably the 50, yeah. 40s or 50s. Although, as far as qualities go, from what I can see, it's pretty close to being original. I think it did get an armory retrofit because it has the safety and the bayonet lug. But. And it uh, clicks very nicely. It oh, adjusts, lovely. it holds position, so does this one. One thing we noticed that really bugged me about putting this one on is as I filed the dovetail, there's no way I could not grind part of that knob. Because a knob is pinned on, you cannot unscrew the knob. I mean, I could have drilled it out and made a huge project, so there's probably one part on this flat. I can't rotate it because it's zeroed. Enough said on that. Easy operation of the M1 carbine. Again, easy retraction force. Flash shot, hold open, worked sometimes. Not very often. Like right now, this 30, this Korean pr produced 30, it's not working. And I think there are multiple mags, which I think mostly we have the Korean ones. Yeah. It just didn't work that much. It should. It didn't. The trigger pull is uh, pretty excellent on this. Uh, I don't know if I have my trigger scale. Uh, you know, it could probably be a bit lighter, maybe six-ish, I'd say. Could be a little bit better. I do think the bolt is great for people, perhaps like your wife, who have arthritis. Super easy mm -hmm. to pull. And that, that's Another part of the point. reason why, because I, I can't toss her a, an AR and expect for her to be able to pull the tiny latch with one hand and yank it if her right. hands are all jacked. Uh, this is a mimmed bottom metal here. You can see the mim lines on it, if I'm not mistaken, are cast. So if that makes you sad, uh, you might want to spring for one of these. Show them that one. So that's Genuine World that. War II. Gorgeous. So it's, it is gorgeous. I mean, even in 1944, they did that. So that's uh, milled steel, if I'm not mistaken. And that takes us to the operation of these two guns. Now, uh, TD, what... What did they choose to do right here, super briefly, with the auto ordnance M1 carving? So this is a different, I'm gonna start with the safety. So here's a cross bolt safety on the auto ordnance. And then we have a rotational safety on the World War II era, go. This is as originally delivered, although I think this is the type two, type one safety had knurling on it. And after a while they figured it was easier to expedite the build and just omit it altogether. So you have your mag release in the front. This one looks like a normal Type 3. It's got the shorter face, the M, the little thing on there. It's supposed to tell you magazine. That way you're sure. Uh, I, I suspect that this is just an off-the-shelf M1 carbine replacement part for some reason, but that's just me. Push safety. They got rid of pretty quick into it Show because this one. it's real easy to confuse your push safety back here with your magazine release. And it's not a great thing to have in a combat firearm. I totally did it, by the way, testing the auto ordnance. You may see footage of it. It's very easy to do, especially with gloves. Yeah. So Oops. you cannot tell if it was knurled, who knows. Yeah. So you come up here, and I'm used to coming up here, and so I'm thinking I'm putting the safety on, and I freaking drop the magazine in the snow. Yeah, yeah we tested this thing in the snow. So this is kind of a downside. Yep. It'd be nice if there was a really tactile way to tell the difference between this. Hmm. Maybe like a lever. Yeah, but this is not kind of awkward as well, you know? Yeah. I think training would be very important just to reach, you know, muscle memory, know where that safety is. Um, I almost wish there was a gate right here or something where you're not, you, you can't just easily come up and press this magazine. I would just rather release. have the safety back here. Just like well, then you're changing the whole M1 carbine formula yeah. and that will piss off a lot of people. And I would totally understand that. Uh, again, look at the wood, the metal, metal fit on the auto ordnance. We have a metal butt plate on it, just like the World War II version. I kind of like that we have a WW2 version to bounce back and forth. It's kind of yeah. cool. Uh, this is a really good repro sling, too. They're pretty inexpensive. Uh, and that's, there's your features, dude. Super easy to take down. I may roll in some pictures. Maybe I won't. So we took it down. We totally lubed it before we shot it. And now we're going to morph, morph into how it shot. It was a little rough breaking it in because of the parkerization, which I mm. thought was pretty cool. It's a good feeling when you pull the bolt and know, hey, they parked all of this. It was tight. Yeah, it was tight and it was gritty. Even though we had lubed it with like Slip 2000 and then Militech, we used uh, just a kind of a viscous synthetic lubrication. And then as we shot it, <laughs> we had some jams. So right out the gate, uh, not a ton of stoppages, but we had stoppages it was at like, the indoor range. Yeah, maybe the first 50 <laughs> rounds or so. Yeah, it was how many a did you mags say? In. I think the, the first five mags, I remember having little issues. It was here, just a couple rounds here and there of each mag and then it would chug along. And, and we were just going, oh gosh, here we go again. Yeah. And then when we spent money on a gun, it's like, oh my gosh, 
because we lost money on the other one. You know that feeling when you buy something and you're excited about it and then it starts to fail you and you have that, what is that, one? that nagging Korean feeling in the back of your head like... It's like a, like a knot <sighs> in the bottom of your stomach. No. Kind of like when I have to go use the bathroom after Tactical Doodles used it. Seriously, it's bad. Kind of like that. I am happy to report as we cycled more rounds through the Auto Ordnance M1 Carbine Model AOM 130, it was 100%. Boom. Even in the desert. So, and TD and I were at the range, we're like, you know what? I think this is a break-in issue, that this gun's tight, it needs to be really ran. So we put hundreds of rounds through it, probably around, like you were saying, 50 rounds. That sounds about right. Probably around from 60 rounds on, and we ended up putting around, I don't know, 500 rounds through this. It was 100%. Maybe one little thing in the desert, like one little, I forget what it was, but we were surprised that with 15 round mags, do you have a 15? Oh, there's one. You got one right there. Yeah. 15 rounds and 30 round mags auto ordnance once broken was 100%. And these are, I think, PW Korean. This is actually the one that came with it, if I remember right. Yeah. Is it? Which, and another thing they're trying to emulate from the original, has a flat base, which you can see we wrote new on to distinguish it from the rest. So flat base, just like the originals. All the mags back in the day were blued. So if you get this and look at it and go, hey, that's cheesy, they couldn't give me a parkerized mag. They didn't parkerize mags unless they were rebuilt, in which case sometimes, supposedly, they just threw them in and said, yeah, we'll parkerize the mags too, so. Two points in that magazine, we talked about the easy retraction force of the bolt. The magazines are also super easy to load. Super easy to load. So that goes back to philosophy use. And the second point I want to make is, I think auto ordnance car should have done parkerized mags. Yeah. This is a modern production. They're, they're kind of mixing up features from different eras as we talked about, which is okay. Why don't you just go ahead and just say, hey, this is going to be our interpretation of the Max. Parkerize it. Kind of like Springfield does with M1A Max. Yeah. That would have been super cool. I think it would add a lot of visual interest to the gun. And sell them Small separately. Small point. Because a bunch of carbine mm -hmm. collectors probably want some too. From your website, make them affordable. Make it so guys can drag it to the basket. Check out easy that's the way we do it these days people don't want to have to go drive hours looking around uh of course there's other places on the internet you can order them from as well if we find one actually no never mind i was going to say amazon they don't sell that crap it's own. and that's a feature pretty like much it is so easy to shoot though the sights are low they're tight it's light the trigger really isn't that bad Everything about it just comes together for the easiest shooting SERP rifle I think we've had out of all of them. And I've said this before, I will say it again, the M1 carbine is one of the funnest guns to shoot for what TD's saying. Low recoil, fast recovery, perfect peak sight picture, which is amazingly accurate. 100%. I mean, we were hitting steel out to 100 yards, like no problem with M1 carbine. Really soft shooting, very non-intimidating to shoot Again, going back to what we said earlier. Uh, reliable once we broke it in, and that takes us to accuracy of the Auto Ordnance M1 carbine. How would the Swedish chef say that, by the way? The Auto Ordnance M1 carbine. <laughs> okay, this is uh, probably indoors. We're just checking it. This is uh, 15 yards. I'm going to go quick. Oh, this is you. So TD on this side. Good job. I'm on the other side. By the way, TD throws these targets into orders at nuttandfancybigcartel.com. These patches right here, you still have some. Yeah. As someone was saying, are you going to get any uh, more patches of the dude drink, uh, drinking his uh, Kool-Aid? Saying Good. I could do this all day? I have them. They're in stock. There you yeah. go. This is 25 yards uh, into battery fails when loading. First round jams rest good. 25 yards open sights. That's pretty freaking amazing. Look at that, dudes. So that's probably as as good as I can do with an open-sided carbine. Again, this is during break-in, so that's why my notes are there. Auto ordnance, Aguila 110 is what we're shooting. Just ammo we bought. Is this you? This yeah, looks like you. that's me. You can tell because it's not very good. Whatever. And then 15 yards, going quickly right here. Um, and then we shot it at, did we do 50 yards? I don't remember out in the desert, maybe not. Um, for me, going out past, I don't know, 50 yards with iron sights, uh, it's going to open up. Uh, generally, you'd expect about two inch group. If you're really, really good at 50 yards and at 100 yards, it's prob probably going to open up a lot worse than that. That's just me. And just for representation, 
Here's this gun, the quality hardware, made in 1944. And this is shooting arms core ammo, and this is sight in 25 yards. I say trigger on this one actually is okay, it's not great. I think the auto ordinance is better, the trigger. The sight drifted on this one, by the way, while we're shooting it. It was 100% with all magazines, and there's your accuracy of the 1944 M1 carbine, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, it shot pretty good. I fixed the sight with uh, some Loctite, so it's in there. But interestingly, uh, that one needs some work because it, it was 100% with all mags, but then we took it out to the mm -hmm. desert. This one was choking. Actually, the World War II one. I think it's a recoil spring problem. Um, so we're going to troubleshoot it. That's another advantage of getting a new production in one carbine. Although for the enthusiasts, it is kind of fun dicking with it a little bit. Well, I don't think fun is sending it back to the manufacturer. This has a one-year warranty on it, by the way, from Auto Ordnance. Uh, hopefully it just works out of the box. Uh, but yeah, some guys do. And then this is the last but not least. Oh, this is a quality hardware. Two stoppages, mostly 100%. I think uh, the range for me on an M1 carbine maximum would probably be, what, 100? Yeah. 100 about. yards. And spit out the feet per second again on that. What All you get, the M1 carbine with 110, 110 grain is what? Almost about 2,000 feet per second. Okay. That's not too shabby, 110 grain bullet, uh, better than a nine millimeter for sure. Yeah. And it weighs actually lighter than a lot of nine millimeter PCCs. And that takes us to competitive options. Uh, how about Fulton Armory is making M1 carbine. They are very expensive though. They're about $1,700. They have some called the M1 service carbine. It looks to be fantastic like a linseed rubbed walnut stock. It is also park rice on a Fulton Armory produced receiver. They adhere to military specification more closely, I think, than this one. Um, but it's a lot of money. You can get bayonet lugged equipped ones. Uh, they have a type three barrel band on those Fultons. They have a really funky one called the M1A1 Scout M1 carbine. It has like yeah. a, it looks like a folding choke stock synthetic and it has pick rails on the front of it. They also have a wood version of that one, non-folding stock. Uh, all these are going to be expensive, though. They're going to be hovering around $1,700. So basically around seven to $800 more than this gun. Is it worth it? I, I can't say anything bad about Fulton's products. I mean, they're really top-notch, and they just charge what they charge. Um, I, I actually like Fulton a lot for what they do, and I, I'm not going to say anything negative about them. They're just more expensive is all. I think I'd be extremely happy with a Fulton M1 carbine. I really would. Yeah. Would they're they're awesome. fantastic. As long as you can pony up for the money. That's, and that's a lot of money. I did find it interesting on their website, though. Fulton's, they said they're only guaranteeing three MOA out of it. Which, for the type, is actually on All par. Right. It, it, maybe it's better than par. Um, and then you have uh, World War II carbines you go out and hunt with, or hunt for if you want. Good luck with that. And buying them online is really a crapshoot. Like, if you go to Gun Broker or something, get a M1 carbine, you may be dreadfully surprised when you get it in hand and go, oh my gosh, the barrel on this sucks. Remember that inland we had? Yeah. The barrel on that was horrific. When I saw it, I almost peed my pants. That and because he was using the bathroom, I didn't want to go in there after him. Fortunately, that gun shot very well though, the inland, the World War II era one. And then you have the inland manufacturing, the modern production. I, I'm sorry, I still don't recommend that one. It just... Didn't do it for me. And in terms of quality too, and I don't know if I really address this, in terms of quality, the auto ordinance really presents very well. It does have some quirks. We have talked about that. Every gun has quirks. It doesn't mean it's perfect. It presents so well. The stock is a total win. The parkerization is a total win. The overall quality of the auto ordinance, at least in presentation, I think is fantastic. If you retrofit it like we did with a winged rear sight, even better even better. So it is a total recommend. Uh, and I think where a lot of guys will buy the auto ordinance in one carbine are guys that are really appreciative like we are of World War II era things. I mean, if you look in the background, you're going to see a lot of World War II stuff back there. We, we love World War II era stuff. And it's also for a person that appreciates, first cool, practicality. Does it work? The answer is yes, it works. It is very accurate for what it is. It was reliable after break-in. It's super lightweight. And so it really has that really cool balance of first cool and second cool. And there isn't a lot of guns that I bring. Oh, I shouldn't say, uh, I should say there aren't a lot of period guns I bring to the bunker or tabletop that fall into that category. What do you think? Would you buy this, this one right here? 
Yeah, I would buy a World War II carbine first. But yeah, so if it's around the same amount of money, go and hold that quality hardware one up. And honestly, I don't... I would agree with that, by the way. But the advantage of this one is what? You can beat the crap out of you it can without beat the crap feeling out. guilty. We already have some dents in the walnut stock from the desert. So this is going to get beat up over the years. It'll be cool. It'll be a family heirloom. Go ahead and put that in pole position right here. So you'd buy a World War II era one first. Yeah. How about the, uh, the or auto ordinance over a standard pistol caliber carbine? Marlin Camp Rifle, Ruger PC Carbon, Mill Sport Carbine, Palmetto, CMMG, Freedom Ordinance, or something like that. What would you do? Okay. If just for first call, home defense. Just for fun, uh, I'd still probably go something like a sub 2K. Yeah. I don't know Good if point. I would, I just, the ammo and mags and all that stuff, the more commonality I have, the better. And the M1 carbine ammo is not cheap. Yeah. It's not like you go to Walmart and buy it. I mean, it's not like uber expensive, but it is what it is. So, do you want to say something? No, they just always say back in the 60s and 70s and stuff that supposedly surplus carbine ammo was cheaper than 22 for a while there. Oh my gosh, that'd be fun. And it's funny, if you go back to the 70s, this was for a, actually a lot of bad guys even, the M1 carbine was a favorite bank robbing <laughs> gun, if I'm remembering right. And uh, that's because it, even back then it worked, it was adequately powerful, had a relatively high magazine capacity. And guess what? None of that has changed. Even this era of fantastic tactical carbines and bull pups like the Tavor in nice. the background. Uh, and that's a Rossi 22 dude. pump, by the way, in case you're wondering. Awesome. That's it. Thanks for tuning in. This has been a bunker review of the Auto, I'm kidding, really Auto nice. Ordnance. Auto Ordnance. Car Arms Walnut Stock Park Rise M1 Carbine. Buy one today. See ya. Don't leave the theater yet. There's still more bunker review to go on the auto ordinance M1 carbine. Things we forgot. TD, take it away. Magazine retention is a little temperamental. Really, the best way to do it is to hold down the mag release. That's the forward button there. As you insert the mag, usually you can see the lugs in the back. Hopefully they hook. If you have everything done right, no issues. If you maybe think you slammed at home harder than you did, it may just drop out on you as soon as you start shooting. And Into not... about a foot of snow, like yeah. according to our useful. experience. Yeah. Uh, we don't remember if we actually said that in the, in the review, but we want to make sure we get the information out there in the video. Okay, so that's the first thing. Secondly, you may have noticed on this Type 1 narrow band sling, there was some tape on it. I forgot to mention, we put that on so it does not mar up the walnut stock. So this part right here, see how that's taped? There we go, it's focusing now. Uh, that's what's up with that. So we didn't mention that. And uh, the, the thing we were criticizing is the width of this was not thick enough to put that canvas strap through. Yeah. That's bad. With the, the tongue, because that's rigid enough that it just doesn't pass through. Affirmative. And when you look at it, you would think, well, if I turn it diagonally and make use of all that, it still doesn't work. Totally doesn't work. Okay, so since we've ended the video, it was like last night, I've already started modding this out. So I've painted the front sight. So that's got a coat of white fingernail polish on it. And then now I'm in my fluorescent face. And actually that was something that TD said as we were shooting steel. What did you say? It's easy to confuse the wings for the sight. It's easy to confuse the wings, especially like we showed you on that quality hardware one. We talked about how the, the sight uh, protective wing was bent and you you could really confuse it on that one so now that's painted it helps out a lot uh, that's the other thing we wanted to share with you and then this is a really good thing we said uh that the accuracy at 50 yards i think i said something in the review that yeah it wasn't that great um i was thinking of another gun because this is what i shot with this gun i actually found the paper and this time i'm going to put it in i may show a picture in the review but either way uh check this out so that's 50 yards open sight. And this was a cider right here. So it's a four round group. That's pretty good, right? And when I shoot at 50 yards, this is the stuff I'll use right here. So a big circle that I can see, it helps with open sights with my eyes. So that's pretty fantastic. And here's another one. I know we didn't show you this one, 50 yards. And I wrote 100% all day and that's in cold weather. A mag release and safety confusion, same, excellent accuracy. And then sight was replaced with this rear sight right here. But look at the groups, dudes. And that's not even shooting the big target. That's shooting 
uh, roll right here. So I would say the Akshi, like I think we represented in the review, is fantastic. Yeah. But I wanted to really add that on before the video ended to make this self-contained. TD, anything else we missed? No, it's just when you see the front sight thing and you think, how on earth would I mix that up? Keep in mind, you have this sight channel here and this sight sits pretty low. So it seems dumb until you really get in there and then you're looking down really close to the wood and I think it helps to occlude stuff. So you're kind of getting tunnel vision and if you're misaligned, then it's easy to see that wing and think, awesome. I, I don't think I confused it at all while I was shooting. I did notice that the black front side blade blends with the steel. Uh, nicely, so you don't have any contrast. So we kind of killed two birds with one stone right there. By the way, here comes the artisan cutlery shark in orange. Love this knife. Hmm. Mini knife review at the end. Awesome. And I think that's it. We got to wrap it up in the bunker. Gun review complete. Thanks for uh, staying in the theater to catch this last part. Bonus. So long. I don't want to. A rock up there. Hit. Oh, totally got it. Awesome, totally awesome. Love it. That's it. Awesome.